Great. Well, welcome everyone. I'm Cynthia Gines from the Institute for the Study of Knowledge Management and Education, and we will be presenting OER discovery research librarian and faculty curation personas. Um, this presentation is the result of our first phase research for an IMLS or Institute of Museum and Library Services um, grant where we're working with six library consortia across the United States, and two of them are represented here, to really build out a, a network where um, consortia can share and ingest OER and kind of benefit from each other's work. And so I have with me Michelle Brennan from ISCME and OER Commons, as well as so Sophie Rondeau, Assessment and E-Resources Program Analyst at Virginia's Academic Library Consortia, and Emily Frank, the Affordable Learning Administrator with Louisiana's Academic Library Consortia, Lewis. So welcome everyone. Jump right in. So I wanted to give a little bit of the background to the research. Um, ISCME has been working for many years with states and library consortia to support their efforts to build out OER microsites within um, OER Commons where they can evaluate and curate and map courses, um, evaluate and curate OER, and then do some course mapping work and build out their OER collections. Um, and what we were seeing through that work over the past years is really a need to support the more efficient discovery and um, search for OER through, for example, enhanced metadata. And what our library partners were seeing, and I will hear from a little bit more about this in a minute, was that they were looking around and kind of noticing that they could be leveraging the curation work of other library consortia in other states so that, that they are able to ingest that amazing work that others are doing and into their own collection. So ingesting that curated content from other states into their own OER um, microsite. And so the project was really born out of this need to increase efficiency, ultimately for faculty and library staff who are looking to find um, OER that's a fit for their courses and for their learners. So I'll move into the next slide now. and. Um, I'm going to give our library partners first the floor to say a little bit about their perspective on the need for this work and the project. Sophie, would you like to start? Yeah, thanks, Cynthia. So, um, yeah, so uh, as mentioned, I'm Sophie. I work with Viva, we're Virginia's Academic Library Consortium. And one of my responsibilities is to um, administrate our Viva Open, which is our instance, Viva's instance of, a, of an OER Commons. And um, our Viva Open microsite was originally intended to serve primarily as a repository for our OER grant projects. And while this continues to be an important focus for us, the site has really grown and is now also home to a large scale course mapping effort, uh, which involves mapping OER to courses at Virginia higher education institutions. And when we started, we knew that other consortia, uh, most notably our colleagues uh, at Lewis, were also mapping OER to high enrollment courses and tagging them with cor course information through their microsite and we wanted to find a way when it was appropriate to piggyback on all the excellent work that they had already done. Um, we know that the topics addressed in high enrollment, general education courses and higher education are often fairly consistent. So finding strategies to cross map OER from Louisiana to Virginia courses was really desirable. Uh, even beyond the desire to find efficiencies with course mapping, I have also felt that finding a way to reduce duplication of effort across higher education microsite partners would be valuable. Um, just doesn't make sense to me that we're all adding the same OER and adding metadata to the same OER um, when we share a common platform. 
Um, as a former library cataloger as well, engaged in cooperative cataloging practices, um, I felt really strongly that there must be ways we could be sharing OER and the metadata to describe it more effectively in the open community, even if only among um, microsite partners. Emily? Great, thanks, Sophie. Yes, I'm Emily with Lewis, the Academic Library Consortium in Louisiana. We moved forward at Lewis with our microsite, um, which you can find at lewis.oercommons.org in fall of 2018 before launching the site in, fall, in, in 2019. And a main goal um, or motivation of our microsite was to leverage what's called the Louisiana Master Course Articulation Matrix. And this maps about 300 gen ed courses across all public two and four year institutions in the state. So the fact that in Louisiana, we have this master course articulation matrix, which makes for a common framework, meant that we could align OER um, to a consistent course ID. And then that consistent course ID aligns with um, a course taught at one of these public institutions. So to do that alignment work, we engaged in a year long project with librarians statewide to review these roughly 300 courses, looking at things like course syllabi, student learning outcomes, and then using that information to align OER to the courses and to tag them with an alignment tag. Um, this was a really resource time intensive process. So it's important for us that this work can be used by others like Viva that Sophie just described um, so that they can facilitate their local OER discovery. Um, these courses are all widely applicable. It's things like English Comp 1, Organic Chemistry, Spanish 1. So even though this was a Louisiana effort, making that work more transferable would be really great. And then one other thing I want to mention that is a priority for us with this project is um, thinking about the role of this collaboration and sustainability. Sustainability is such an important consideration in OER and in infrastructure, and I think that this project can help with that in terms of the staff time needed to sustain and grow the microsite. You know, we have limited staff um, that can apply time to this work at Lewis and at our member campuses, the librarians that we work with who support OER are often stretched thin. And so, you know, as we want our microsite to be easy to use, up to date, efficient, uh, the more that we can leverage the work of others like Viva, um, the more that we can automate the process of adding new content or deaccessioning inaccessible content, then the more that we and the librarians that we work with can invest in other open education activities. Thanks, Emily. Um, I am Michelle Brennan, um, and I had the pleasure and honor of working with with both Emily and Sophie to design and um, implement and launch um, their projects. Uh, so Emily uh, was, was my first large scale course mapping project. Um, and we worked uh, with a wonderful librarian who is not here with us today, Emily Rogers, um, to sort of develop this framework for curation and evaluation, um, a large scale effort. Um, and, and that sort of gave me um, a really deep look into what the current processes are for librarians. Um, and sort of, sort of a, a beginning start to understand how how the how librarians um, engage with faculty um, in sort of curation and co-evaluation of OER, um, and then transitioning from the Lewis project into the project with Sophie at Viva. Um, her really strong background as a cataloger, especially with her expertise in 
um, collaborative cataloging, and she really understood the nuts and bolts of the technical processes and the metadata, sort of working with her to bring all of this evaluation and curation work and the framework we'd used with Emily um, into Viva and sort of looking at what does it really mean um, when we take collections from one locality and transfer them to another one. Um, and I remember uh, a really clear like aha moment for me. It was a workshop that we did um, at GMU in person with a group of librarians. Um, and we actually had them review some course content that had been brought over from Lewis and just um, working through them, through with them, sort of like the, the questions that they had, the uncertainties that they had, you know, their, their, their needs. Um, and all of this together really um, clarified for me, and I think probably both for Emily and Sophie, um, a vision of what wasn't working and, and what we could do to make things better, um, especially from a librarian perspective. Um, but what this project and, and the research are going to present here today um, also expanded that um, to really getting to understand and know um, our faculty needs um, and our faculty users, instructors as well, um, to really ensure that if we do all of this work, um, are we giving folks what they need to make decisions and to adopt and use OER confidently? Um, so I um, was definitely so excited and grateful um, that we were able to get this project funded and, and to share the research with you all today. Thanks, Michelle. And that's a great segue into our research question. So in order to do this work, we of course needed to understand library staff and faculty's current curation processes, their pain points, and how do they make decisions that about OER that's a fit for them. What existing metadata extension or what extensions to existing metadata are needed to really help them make their decisions around OER that they would like to use and incorporate? And then what pain points do they encounter in the OER curation process? So these were the three core questions. There were other sort of sub questions, but these are the main questions that drove the um, research that we're going to present today. And the approach was to work with our six partnering consortia. And I didn't mention this before, but we also, um, in addition to Viva and Lewis, Ohio's library consortium, Ohio Link is a partner on the project and they're represented in this work today, as well as the Digital Higher Education Consortium of Texas, and then Indiana's private library network, Palmy, and then the Partnership for Academic Library Collaboration and Innovation, which um, covers Pennsylvania, New Jersey, West Virginia, and New York are also represented in the work. So to do the research, we first, um, really wanted to recruit folks from across these um, the states, the partnering states and consortia. And we wanted to find individuals that had, of course, some experience in curating OER. And we did a pre-screening survey, um, did a lot of outreach, um, working with our partners like Emily and Sophie. And we ended up um, identifying 35, a mix of 35 faculty and library staff to participate in these um, OER curation um, interviews, as we're calling them. And so we conducted 90 minute interviews where we asked um, the participants to walk us through their sort of OER journey, um, how they moved through the process of identifying OER, evaluating it, and determining whether they want to use it. And then we also, as part of that process, asked them to make statements on the utility of different types of metadata in that process. So we analyzed the data and then we developed what we're calling user personas um, and user stories. And Michelle will get into that in a little bit um, for both the faculty and library staff curators. 
And then, of course, the, the outcome of this work is to really be able to translate those findings into a design um, of an OER exchange network where um, OER can be ingested and shared across, across silos and states. So, Michelle, I'll let you jump into the findings. All right. Thanks, Cynthia. Um, so we, the next uh, few slides will give you more details about our five personas. So our uh, five different types of users. So we have two faculty personas and three librarian personas. Um, Kendra is our textbook replacer. Um, Kevin, our a la carte curator. Um, Mira is our on the ground OER reference librarian. Jacques, uh, he is our very classy collections maintenance librarian. Um, and then Eva, course redesign support librarian. Um, and so I would really uh, um, encourage you to think about, and it's how I think about it. Um, so I think everyone is familiar with a reference librarian. So I think of Jacques um, just as an overall um, collections librarian and Eva really more as a combination between um, an OER librarian and a special collections librarian because she is curating very special um, specific uh, collections um, to reflect courses. All right, I think we can move on and dig into our first persona, Kendra. I'll give you a few moments uh, just to take this in. So um, Kendra um, uh, is, is your faculty or instructor who um, they really understand the value of OER. They understand um, that it reduces student costs. Um, they understand that students are more likely to take their, their courses um, and to be able to be successful in their courses when they don't have to worry about textbook costs. Um, but they're often driven um, by some external factors. Uh, for example, um, being in um, compliance or wanting to participate um, in campus initiatives or policies. Um, and they and Kendra um, wants to spend as least time as possible um, curating, uh, switching out the publisher textbook uh, for the um, for the open content. Um, often uh, these folks are could be newer um, faculty or professors. Um, they're not as familiar with the content that they're teaching. They may also be um, adjunct um, who are have been just thrown a course um, they've never taught before. Um, and they they don't have a whole lot of time. Um, so this person is looking specifically for things that look like and feel like your traditional textbooks and ancillaries. All right. Um, we'll move on to Kevin, um, our a la carte curator. So again, I'll give you a few moments just to scan it. So Kevin um, is really a curious person, um, really, really focused on uh, the design of course content, um, you know, as, as an art. Um, very familiar with the content that they're teaching. Um, possibly a veteran educator, but certainly an educator who's experienced with the content and has taught the course many times. Um, and so really motivated internally um, to be focused on creating fun and exciting learning experiences 
um, is it wants to be very hands-on. Um, sort of the the word that I heard from from our UX researcher was really likes to create create bespoke courses. Um, and so uh, will, this person will spend you know a lot of time searching for that you know perfect, exciting thing, definitely a novelty seeker. Um, and Kendra's got a, a, a pretty, pretty low frustration threshold. Kevin's got a pretty high one. Um, definitely willing to get in there and, and wait around. All right. All right, so we've got Mira, our reference librarian. So Mira is really on the front lines. Um, she is interacting with faculty um, who come to her uh, seeking support uh, for content far beyond OER. So she's working with all of the e-resources databases, um, all of the, the e-books collections and OER is part of her work, but it is not, it is by far not uh, her only focus. So she's got a lot to do, um, often liaising with multiple faculty members across multiple departments, um, but she is really dedicated to advocating for OER. So she wants to make her faculty happy so that they have a good impression of OER, um, and that she can advocate for um, folks adopting it. Um, so she's looking to build uh, smaller sets of resources for individual faculty. All right, so we've got, uh, <laughs> that's okay, you can move to the next one, yep. All right, so we've got Jacques, um, who's the collections maintenance librarian. Uh, Jacques is focused um, really um, more on breadth of the and, and um, depth of the entire catalog or repository. So really focused on um, identifying overall subject area gaps that there might be. Um, might get the information from faculty or other reference librarians, um, but also is, is looking for collections uh, that he can import um, or make available and discoverable for his faculty and, and other reference librarians. Really focus on the um, quality of the metadata and um, the technical aspect of bringing in content in bulk. Um, so would know a lot about um, uh, how the technology works um, and how metadata is interoperable or not interoperable. Um, okay. Uh, and last but not least, we have our lovely course redesign support librarian, AKA Special Collections. Um, so, uh, so Emily and Sophie are two um, very expert course redesign support librarians. Um, so they are focusing on um, building out um, a breadth of collections for specific courses. So that means that um, you may, might have, you know, a catalog of 200 courses and are looking for ways to fill collections um, that are likely gonna be relevant for all of those, um, across all of those subject areas. Um, so definitely uh, working to, um, support both faculty and other librarians, but definitely it is a, um, a combination of both understanding the technical aspects um, 
of collections like metadata, as well as the user needs um, and understanding um, how to and uh, um, to enact uh, a review of the content and understand the user needs. Um, okay, so we can move on um, to the next slide. So oh, go back one more. Yeah, there we go. I'm having trouble yeah. with my mouth. <laughs> oh, that's all right. Um, so we'll just spend a moment here. Um, so after we uh, uh, coded the research, uh, the interviews uh, for these five personas, um, we went through um, and we, we looked at um, quotes from the um, interviews um, and we built out user stories. So for example, um, as a faculty textbook replacer, I want to find content that looks exactly like my textbook, but is open so that I can provide free content for my students. Um, so that, you know, that is a basic user story and um, that we heard over and over again from folks who were part of the textbook uh, faculty replacer um, persona. Uh, so we created um, multiple stickies for these user stories, um, organized them by persona, and then we created a user journey. Um, so that meant we organized them into um, steps in the process of, okay, I've decided that I want to use OER. So that's where, that's the searching part. It's my search start points and my motivations. Um, and then once I've found something to search for and I've started searching, how do I evaluate it? What user stories do we have that tell us about how each type of persona evaluates OER? Um, then we uh, identified selecting. So how do I know when I've found something that I like and what do I want to do with it? It's the next in the journey. Um, and then sharing is the final step in the journey um, where you've found something you like, you've used it, and now you want to share it back and the cycle starts all over again. Uh, so our goal here um, was to really understand the, um, the motivations, uh, goals, and pain points for each type of user. Um, but we also wanted to look across the personas and identify what they had in common. Um, so what they had in common would tell us a lot about what the most um, basic user needs were um, for the OER exchange that, that we were creating. Um, so yeah, this next slide, um, we're gonna talk, I'll talk a little bit about um, some of the main highlights for each persona before we talk about um, what they had in common. Um, so Kendra, uh, her motivations are uh, large. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, her motivations are largely external. So wanting to attract more students to the course or being in compliance with um, policies. Um, her goals are um, to switch out that content as quickly as possible and in little time as possible. Um, and, and her pain point is that she just wants OER to look like and be packaged like your usual textbook and ancillaries. Um, OER right now doesn't always look like that and it's not always packaged like that. And that makes it hard for her um, to make the, make the transition and, and make the leap. Um, Kevin, um, you know, he's motivated internally, um, you know, wants to keep the course content relevant. 
um, really has drive and inspiration to build new and creative learning experiences. Um, his goal really is just to find the newest and most interesting content for his course. Um, but one thing that he does do that make that that is a little bit difficult is liking to mix and match and combine a lot of diverse types of materials, um, looking at games and interactives and videos and news articles. Um, and he has a hard time understanding, well, if I combine all of these things, is it still OER? How can I, what does that license look like? How can I understand what I can use and when? Um, because I want to use so many different things. Um, Mira, um, she's supporting specific faculty um, or been tasked with supporting um, affordable learning initiatives. Her goal is really, she wants to find um, really targeted smaller sets of OER um, that meet the, the specific needs of her faculty members. Um, and she wants to be able to have sets of OER that she can refer to and return to in the future. Um, and maybe leverage for different types of faculty members, but really build up uh, her reference sets of OER. Um, and it's difficult for her though, because she um, is a librarian and um, is being asked to find content for professors for really specific subject areas. Um, especially challenging for the upper level courses that are very specific and niche. And that causes some discomfort for Mira because she is not a subject matter expert and um, may not feel confident in her ability to provide appropriate reference materials for her faculty. Um, Michelle, I just wanted to give you a time notice. We have we have to save about two minutes for um, for discussion at the end. So if we might have to go a little bit faster, I'm so sorry. I'm really enjoying. Oh no, that's what okay. You're um, yeah. yeah. So we'll just go quickly, Jacques and Eva. Um, so Jacques' main pain point um, is that OER collection maintenance requires a lot of manual work. Um, OER repositories, there are a lot of them systems aren't interoperable and the metadata is inconsistent. So technically it's difficult uh, to harvest OER collections. Um, and for Eva, um, she's got a lot of courses to curate to and individual um, evaluation of OER um, is time consuming. Um, and the metadata that currently exists uh, doesn't efficiently express everything she needs to know about quality and fit. So it makes it hard for her to identify collections of content that are appropriate quickly. All right, and do we have time, Cynthia, to, to touch on the similarities? Um, we have about a minute left. Maybe okay. we should go in to, gosh, sure. I'm having some technical problems. Um, That's fine. The slides will be available. Um, there we go. Yeah. Yes, we, we were going to cover a little bit more about the summary, what, what was common across. Um, did you want to say anything there, Michelle? Or Yeah, so we can, so um, looking across the user needs, um, we ranked um, you know, the metadata that is important um, to, to all users. And we really wanted to focus in on the evaluation process. Um, so understanding what a resource is, does the content fit needs? Um, is it a quality resource and how easy will it be to use? Um, and sort of one of the key takeaways from that as far as metadata ex extensions, um, was that we really needed um, more robust user evaluations um, and um, definitely more um, 
granular topical information about content, um, as well as um, increased um, uh, accessibility information. Um, that information is really difficult for folks to parse, um, but it's often a deal breaker. Can you see my screen still? I can, yes. Great, okay. To advance. So I thought we could move into just our implication slide um, as I'm waiting for my computer to catch up to my hand. Um, and maybe, Sophie, you could start by sharing um, how you've taken these findings and how they support your work at SIVA. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I found this process of working with these personas really, really gratifying. I, I think that having those personas kind of humanized um, and, and helped me to understand needs. I will say that some of the needs and the desires that I encountered um, through the process were, were needs I had heard of um, because we work with faculty to review the OER that we have mapped. Um, but the focus on metadata needs was particularly interesting and um, the personas helped me to think more strategically about um, the metadata needs and, and, and what I apply uh, when I'm adding new content to the site. Um, for example, Kendra's desire for comprehensiveness. Um, now I think about that carefully. Um, and if there's a table of contents that I can add to the description, I, I do. Um, in, and that was in part because I understood that, that that's especially helpful for her. Um, I think that, you know, some of the needs identified in the personas were things that we can address on the platform, but I think that some of the needs also require more careful deliberation, outreach, and maybe even training. Um, so somebody like Kevin, maybe some kind of um, training and licensing or so on, or outreach related to those kinds of things could be helpful. And I will say it was really uh, great to see my own needs reflected in the personas and then to, to kind of hash that, those out with um, consortial um, members, the other partners to figure out strategies we might, um, you know, invite ISKME to consider creating to create efficiencies and, and um, to help us with our work. Emily, did you wanna say something? Yeah, I'll just add that I think, um, you know, for us, Jacques' pain point on inconsistent metadata is a pain point um, we share. And so there's a real opportunity for us to achieve more consistency um, and allow folks to use our site in a more complex way. We, with the course alignment tags, um, those are extremely consistent. But in working with librarians, you know, in retrospect, we, we didn't plan for the inconsistencies around things like metadata, I'm sorry, accessibility, education level, material type. And so being able to um, work with all these other microsites and achieve more uniform and complete records will really be an enhancement to our site in terms of discovery. Michelle? Um, I've spent a lot of time talking, so if you want to punt to some questions, then that is fine. Yeah, great. Yes, please. And I'm so sorry about the technical problems here. Um, let's see, let's look in the chat and see what folks are writing there. And if anybody has questions um, verbally you'd like to share, please do. There's one of oh, what can so content creators do to better support your work? Michelle, do you want to answer that? Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I think one thing, um, one thing that is really difficult is matching of ancillary content to core texts. Um, and I know that OpenStax has done some of that work with collecting together assessment items that they make available. And I know Sophie has been working on ways to make those types of ancillaries um, available uh, sort of behind a authentication wall um, for folks to access. But I definitely 
think uh, thinking about a we are a creation um, as packaged together uh, to make it as easy for the Kendras of the world to transition over to OER, kind of bring them into the fold would be uh, a really a value add and a win.